Hey, this video is on Act 3 of Volpone. Um, Act 3, as is appropriate, marks a turning point in the play, the point at which Benario, hidden away in a room, um, observes Volpone leap out of bed and attempt to rape Celia. Um, rape only coming in at the end. First he tries to persuade her, um, but at this point you would think the cat is out of the bag. Now, after this occurs, as is very typical in Ben Johnson's plays, the plot gets even more and more and more complicated as we move toward the end. It speeds up, it goes faster and faster. Johnson is a master at acceleration until he's got so many balls in the air that you don't know how he can uh, bring them to an end. Um, and basically what interests him here, I think, as in The Alchemist, is improvisational theater as uh, Mosca, Volpone, and even some of the characters they're trying to swindle um, try to improvise what essentially become plays or fictions uh, in order to uh, get whatever it is that they want. <coughs> so the play begins with Mosca uh, celebrating his beautiful um, parasitical swindlings in the first two acts. And he has a long speech, it's one of the best uh, in the play, I think, about how wonderful it is to be a parasite and that although almost all of the world is parasitical, to be a really good parasite is to be a really good actor, to be able to switch from role to role to role that fast, uh, coming up with whatever is required for the moment. Um, I'll let you read that speech on your own, but I think it is one of the play that is worth spending some time on if you want to really get at the get at the heart of the play, because in a way Johnson here is really celebrating acting. So Benario gives this speech, and then in comes a new character, Bonario. Excuse me, Mosca gives the speech, and in comes a new character, Benario, the son of uh, Corbaccio who stands to be disinherited because Mosca has come up with a plot where he has convinced Corbaccio to write uh, Volpone a will uh, in exchange for Volpone's will. And since Corbaccio is really, really old and Volpone actually is probably middle-aged, this seems like a really good bet that they will be able to take uh, the entire estate of Corbaccio away from his son, Benario. Well, given this, you have to ask why, at this point then, right after this speech, Mosca tells Benario that this is what they're going to do. Uh, he says, you know, your father is seeking to disinherit you. And uh, Benario doesn't believe him. We go through a lot of speeches where Benario tells Mosca how loathsome Mosca is and how Benario normally would speak with him, but Benario is taken in by Mosca's protestations of innocence and his tears. Benario is a kind of uh, archetype of naive goodness. Uh, he's willing to take things at face value way, way too much. He's willing to forgive, you might say, way too easily. He should, uh, he should have trusted his initial instincts. Uh, how do you practice the kind of Christian love which Benario and Celia stand for in a world as commercial and grasping and evil uh, as the one of Venice? It's a big question. Always has been. Um, uh, is it possible to do that without being fooled again and again and again? Um, I'll, leave, I'll leave that one up to you. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, Benario actually suggests, or um, I'm sorry, Mosca actually suggests that Benario come to Volpone's house so he can observe his father with the will that he's attempting to give Volpone. Now, I think that there are, there are two possibilities here. Um, later in this act, uh, after Volponi has been revealed to Celia and Benario as a fraud, Mosca has to come up with a story to Voltore uh, about um, 
about the trouble that's been in the house because Benario has assaulted Mosca and uh, he's got to come up with an explanation. And so he gives him this explanation. He says, Benario tried to murder his father uh, because uh, he, he saw his father disinheriting him. I don't think that's the reason that uh, Mosca has in mind at the beginning, though. Uh, here's what I think is going on. Mosca is such a ham actor. He loves applause so much, and he is so swollen with pride in his abilities to take people in that essentially he tells Benario just for the hell of it, just because he thinks that no matter what he does, he's always going to be able to improvise a role or a play script on the spot to get him out of trouble. It's as if he's setting up a challenge for himself in Volponi. Now, as ridiculous as that may seem, what I would argue is that it's consistent with the psychology that we've seen so far in both Volpone and Mosca, and it remains consistent with it to the end of the play, as we see Volpone exulting over the people that he's gulled toward the end of the play in much the same way. Um, perhaps you need a lot of brass and a lot of pride to be a great actor, but this is also uh, the Achilles heel of Mosca and Volpone. Okay. So we get the scene where um, Volponi then attempts to seduce Celia. Uh, Celia is brought in by her husband, uh, Corvino, who has threatened her with all kinds of horrible tortures and disfigurations, um, the same kinds of things that he threatened her with when he thought that she was being too outgoing. Uh, when she displayed herself even just at the window of her apartment, um, he was so jealous he was going to do all these horrible things to her. Now he's going to do all these horrible things to her if she doesn't lay with Volpone, who he says is impotent anyway. And when none of the threats work, he starts almost like a little kid begging her, oh, please, Celia, you know, do this for me, I'll be ruined, da -da -da -da. and that doesn't work. That doesn't work either until finally Mosca steps in and says, I'll tell you what, Corvino, you know, no woman can, can be expected to uh, have sex with another man in front of her husband. So let's just leave her alone uh, with Volpone. She'll come around. So Mosca gets Corvino out of the room. And then we get the best stage direction uh, in the play, uh, which is that Volpone leaps out of his bed. Um, much to the surprise, I'm sure, of Celia. And that I think if this is done well, it's got to be perhaps the funniest moment in the play. Uh, Moliere has a moment very much uh, like this and a scene very much like this in the play Tartuffe. I think that Johnson must have impressed him. So the other great speech in the play, I think, is, or at least in the scene, is Volpone's attempted seduction, uh, his speech. And again, it gets you into the heart of the thematic material of the play. Um, he's trying to tempt her, and he talks about all the different kinds of exotic foods that they'll have to eat and drink, something that Sir Epicure Mammon will pick up in even more detail in um, the next play, The Alchemist. And he says, my, I'll have my eunuch sing, my fool make up the antic, whilst we, in changed shapes, act Ovid's tales. So again, he gets back to acting. Uh, he says, we'll take on all these different roles. Um, then I like, excuse me, um, thou like Europa now, and I like Jove. Then I like Mars, and thou like Erisene. So of the rest, till we have quite run through and wearied all the fables of the gods, then will I have thee in more modern forms, attired like some sprightly dame of France, brave Tuscan lady, or proud Spanish beauty. Sometimes unto the Persian Sophie's wife, or the grand senior's mistress, and for change to one of our most artful courtesans, or some quick negro or cold Russian, and I will meet thee in as many shapes where we may so transfuse our wandering souls out at our lips and score up sums of pleasures. Um, this key speech in the play, I think I mentioned uh, at the beginning that 
this play is in some ways a proof of uh, Augustine's statement in uh, the Confessions. Um, Lord, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. But Volponi doesn't really believe that. Volponi is not just a consumer of different kinds of goods, jewels of all different kinds, food of all different kinds, but he's also a consumer of personalities, or we, maybe we should say personas. Um, to be just one person isn't enough for Volponi, and here he's a consummate actor again, an actor who, very much like Bottom in Shakespeare, wants to play all the parts. Volponi would like to be all people. Um, and this is what he invites Celia to do. We will pretend we are everything, everything under the sun. Now you can you can attack this in all different kinds of ways. Um, you can you can uh, talk about its impossibility. Uh, you can talk about a kind of basic lack of integrity, a kind of protean self that doesn't really have any shape. You can you can fault. Um, Volponi for all of these things, and yet it's very human to want to be different people. Uh, I think it's one of the big reasons why we go to movies and see stories. We want to inhabit different different kinds of human beings and see what life looks like from their side. Now, of course, Volponi is only interested in love. He wants to be every kind of lover, and he wants Celia to be every kind of lover. He wants an infinite amount of sexual pleasure. And the thing about Volponi is he figures he can get it, or if not infinite fulfillment, he can at least get so much of it that uh, it will be more than enough for him during the course of one human lifetime. And I think that there are probably many, many people who feel that way. Um, there is something about Volponi, and I think uh, some of the characters that we meet in Johnson's other plays which appeals to us uh, that they have great, um, great desire, but a great appreciation for many of the things in life which really are desirable. It's just that they've gone off the rails a little bit. Um, yet their appreciation is, in some sense, warranted. Um, Good food, good sex. I mean, what's uh, what's to complain about, right? So um, Volponi takes us into that mindset. Um, now, of course, Benario is hiding um, somewhere. Pick a spot on stage where you'd put him, under a table, behind a couch. Uh, I would want his jumping out to be uh, almost as astonishing and funny as Volponi's. And he rescues Celia and uh, probably gives Volponi a good knock and then we find out that he's uh, attacked Mosca too on the way out. And Volponi gives up everything at that at that point. He, he feels like the police are going to be on the way. He can already feel the tortures that he's going to put it, be put under. And so um, that is where the scene ends. How are they ever going to get themselves out of this one? I'll say just a little bit about one other scene, the scene involving Lady Politic would be. Um, again, there's another scene like this that you're going to see in The Alchemist uh, involving a uh, con woman by the name of uh, Dalcommon who uh, impersonates a lady who starts speaking theological nonsense whenever she hears anything about the Bible mentioned. Um, in this case, we have Lady Politic Woodby, who every time um, Volponi changes the subject when she comes to visit him, right, to, to make him feel better, um, sails off into that subject. There isn't anything that she can't talk about and talk about at long, tedious length. So all of Volponi's twists and turnings, he's very much the fox here, who's uh, being chased, uh, you might say, by an, old, by an old English lady on a horse um, who cannot get away no matter what he does. Finally, he's rescued by Mosca. Mosca knows how to get him out of it. Uh, he tells her, Ah, uh, Miss Woodby, I saw your husband with one of the most notorious courtesans of Venice. 
and she immediately uh, decides to go after after her husband. Uh, the Whitbys in this are definitely a kind of sideshow, and uh, it would seem to me that you could almost carve them out of this play entirely. You could shorten it a bit and not and not miss very much. Um, we're going to have to ask ourselves the question of, do we really need them in there? Why didn't Johnson include them? Okay, that's enough for Act 3.